India is hungry for energy. Over 170 new power plants, all coal-fired, will be built to power the nation's high-tech industries and booming cities. But the country's dependence on coal is leaving a dirty trail of violence, landlessness and poverty. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. On this edition of 101 East, we meet the winners and losers of India's coal rush. Mining in India's Jarya coal fields starts as a firefighting operation. A burning mountain of coal must first be extinguished. Dousing these flames is extremely risky. Adding water produces a deadly cocktail of gases, carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide. When we are, when we are putting water on the direct blazing fire, two gases are formed at a time. H2 and CO, and uh, that can explode. Uh, it is quite dangerous. We are pour pouring water at the rate of, uh, at the pressure, uh, 7 kg per square centimeter. We are pouring water along with high pressure, at the rate of high pressure, and water is penetrating into the fire, and fire is gradually extinguished. India needs this fossil fuel more than ever, and tonight the miners must get to the vast deposits of coal before the fire does. Under intense heat, the machines move in. Only then does the real business of mining start. Coal is making many Indians very wealthy, for others, it is creating a living hell. This is heaven for us. We are working here and getting salary, and uh, our family are depending upon this. So this is not hell. This is for our, for ours. This is heaven. Heaven. We are treating is heaven. This is the unseen artery that is feeding India's explosive growth. Every night, coal trains leave from Danbad in Jharkhand state. They will travel hundreds of kilometers to mega power plants that light up India's homes and new high-tech industries. But the journey of coal from the countryside to the cities must cross a yawning gap between the new and the old India. My name is Ashok Agarwal. By training, I'm a physicist, but I'm in the business of selling industrial spares to the industries and the colonies around this area. And basically, you know, at one time when I was growing up, I was I had hopes that this place, this area is going to grow richer and richer, and we'll have plenty of opportunities. But with the passage of time now, I don't see that happening. I don't see my children having a very good life here. They'll have to eventually go somewhere else because there are certain people who are bent upon destroying this place. You see, there are huge tracts of land which were once thickly wooded. There are thick jungles over here. These are absolutely green. Now what you see is this desolate area there are huge mounds of this overburden, the rubble that you see. The entire jungles have been destroyed, and this land will never be, you will, we will never be able to recover it. And this destruction is going to carry on. The Jaria coal fires have burned for nearly 100 years. The earth here can reach temperatures of up to 700 degrees Celsius. There are more than 70 fires in Jaria, making this the largest coal fire complex in the world. The fires spread when coal spontaneously combusts as it is exposed to air during mining operations. Uh, 
Uh, you see, when you walk around this area, you'll, you'll get the feeling that something dreadful has gone on here. There has been a massive war. The fires have crept underneath the town of Jaria. Homes have been abandoned as heat and poisonous fumes break through the surface. In the next few years, some quarter of a million people will need to be evacuated. Eventually, this entire area is going to become a huge crater which will stretch, which will have a diameter of around 20 or 30 kilometers. That is how we, I look at it. It is such a beautiful place. And today, look at the, the place, what is happening to it. Gradually, most of the areas are going in for open cast mining. That means the entire place is being opened up, opened up, and you can see the craters here. There are massive mounds of rubbles and huge craters. So what will become of this place? When coal mining started in Danbad over a hundred years ago, the people here never imagined it would come to this. Danbad was renowned throughout India for its high quality coal, extracted through a network of underground tunnels. This area was always conducive for underground mining. The coal goes to a depth of around 2,000 feet, and we've got around 40 to 45 seams. So that, that is why the best method of mining here was through underground deep mining. Being a coal miner is a highly sought after job. It pays relatively good wages, health care, and retirement. Coal mining was a common job here. Underneath Danbad, tens of thousands of these workers were employed by the Bharat Coking Coal Company, a subsidiary of Coal India, the largest coal company in the world. But faced with deep cuts, the number of these permanent workers has been reduced to a third. These coal miners have become the exception. You can actually go and see the figures. The number of min miners have been reduced drastically. No, I never thought that this is, going to, this is going to be the situation because I had always thought that we'll carry on with underground mining, which is quite all right. The people used to live happily on the surface and mining of coal was done underground. Now, a surge in demand for coal has favored a more aggressive method. You see, open cast mining compared to under underground mining is easier because you just open up the land and you have access to the coal. It is cheaper and it is quicker. Open cast mining produces mountains of waste. At one of many dump sites, the giant mining trucks leave a trail of desperation. Every day, the coal scavengers come. The police sometimes hide inside the dump trucks to surprise the scavengers, but the news spreads quickly.
At dawn, an even more dangerous cat and mouse game begins. Coal pickers, mostly children, sneak into the smoldering government mine. <laughs> Noxious gases and the fine coal dust have created an epidemic of lung diseases for the people of India's coal belt. At a local clinic in Danbad, most patients come for breathing problems. When we take the whole history of the patient, such type of patient belong to the those who are close to the mines, eh, those who are working inside the mines or living surrounding the mines. Dr. Om Prakash Agarwal says the lungs he sees are clogged with coal dust. You can see these white patches. The lung function is more or less halved in this X-ray plate. So their ex life expectancy is 10 to 20 years less than the people living in the healthy area. But the filthy air in Danbad seems to be the least of people's concerns. Here in the heart of India's coal belt, there's much to celebrate. The local economy is booming, and Danbad is shedding its unruly frontier town image to become a new economic hub in Jharkhand. And word has spread that new fortunes can be made on coal. Basically, I'm Neeraj Singh. I'm uh, the deputy mayor of this uh, Dhanbad Municipal Corporation. And uh, my family, uh, my father along with his brothers, they did migrate to this place, uh, Dhanbad, in search of new business, in search of uh, new opportunities. And they entered this uh, coal market somewhere around in early 70s. After this, we'll find the multiplexing. Today, Neeraj Singh is showing off one of his family's investments, the newest theater in town. He belongs to a small elite who've made it big on coal. We do have a lot of, uh, you know, political leaders along in my family and in the branches of my family. So since then, uh, we have got a very good hold on the market of uh, coal and even in politics. Okay, this is, you know, again one of the major sources for the entertainment for the people of Dhanbad. After getting this multiplex in our city, uh, the people really enjoy their time and... Uh, again, uh, the source is coal and it's uh, due to the coal that we people are dreaming. Due to the uh, growth uh, and boom in the economy due to the coal, the coal has made us, the money generated from the coal, the money recycled from the coal has made our dreams too big, made our expectations uh, to a, such a high point that uh, today, you know, the people of Dhanbad, they also think that, that nothing is uh, impossible. Coal is the cheapest and most abundant fossil fuel, and India has little choice but to use it. 
but the supply from this vast coal belt can barely keep up with demand. The speed of India's growth depends on how much electricity this nation can produce. And so one of the largest industrial programs is underway to quench India's thirst for energy. In 2010, the government approved the construction of more than 170 mega power plants, and the fuel to power them will need to come from new, untapped coal fields. There is a coal rush because, you see, basically our source of energy is only coal. We don't have any other source of energy. We talk about nuclear power, but that's a very far dream. And it, it can definitely not meet the demands of this country. Right now, you see, a big chunk of the population is deprived of electricity and all the basic necessities. One company leading the coal rush is the Adani Group, a multi-billion dollar private conglomerate. In many of their public relations videos, poor Indian children are shown receiving the gift of electricity. It's a happy and sanitized story, but one that leaves out growing public anger over the company's plans for open cast mining in the eastern state of Orissa. Here in the Chendipada district of Orissa, villagers stand to lose 7,000 acres of prime farmland. Nine villages will be displaced and moved into a resettlement area. District and state officials who approved the mining lease for the Adani company claim it was done all with the villagers' consent. But those gathered here say they only heard about the deal through a notice in the local newspaper. They say the signatures granting consent were gathered fraudulently. Some false persons must have given the signature in our names. None of us have given any signature as none of the government or private agency has come to us, has come to any villages of the nine affected villages and have a meeting till now. Because they know it very well that uh, the people will going, go to object their uh, project because they have nothing to give us. They will take us, take everything from us, but they have nothing to give us. Meeting for the first time, the villagers vent their anger. The farmers of Orissa's Chendipada district have everything to lose. The Adani company will turn these ancient paddy fields into a series of vast open pit coal mines. The coal will be shipped out to power industries in the western state of Gujarat, more than 1,500 kilometers away. For farmers like Draupadi Shao, Adani's coal mine spells the death of a way of life that has sustained her family for generations. <laughs>
Those who've resisted powerful mining companies have paid dearly. In Jharkhand State, the fresh grave of an anti-mining activist. Valsa John Malamel was a Catholic nun who organized against large open caste mining in the Rajmahal Hills of Jharkhand. Here, Sister Valsa fought for the rights of a tribal minority called the Santals. There was a single-minded purpose in her to work with the women, to work with the tribals, and to see where she can become part of their struggle, part of their daily struggle. For 12 years, Sister Valsa lived among the Santals, who've been disproportionately affected by mining. This region is desperately poor. The Santals lack the most basic of government services. When Panem Coal Mines Limited entered the area 10 years ago, Sister Valsa organized a resistance movement against it. Any movement that is taking place against a very powerful private company will face conflict. And it is in that conflictual zone, she, along with her associates, she began to be very active, following very democratic methods of resistance. Sister Valsa and other villagers barricaded roads, cutting off access to company mining trucks. They lobbied government officials and took Panem coal mines to court. Over time, her movement forced the company to make some concessions including a plan to compensate villagers for their land. But the mining company deeply split villagers here between those who took compensation and those who refused it. Sister Valsa's movement began to crumble. Let us remember that in any of the mining area, money began to flow. Money begins to flow. And the money, in fact, will judge many of the things. On November 15, 2011, a large group of men stormed this house in Pachawara village where Sister Valsa stayed. Here, she was brutally murdered. The police have arrested 13 suspects in the murder. Six of them hold contracts with Panem coal mines. The company has denied any involvement in the murder of Sister Valsa. We are not sure uh, what were the real actual motives for a murder of a very a simple nun working deep in the villages. We are not very sure of it, but we are just questioning. Is it the consequences of a brutalization of the violence that is imposed by the mining? The very fact that the mining actually extracts you know, desecrates the earth, that in itself is a violence, actually. I think probably this violence gradually permeates to the other communities. Is it true? This is only a reflection. This is only a question that we need to raise. There will never be enough coal to keep up with India's growing demand for energy, as there will never be enough water to douse these fires. So it's time that we start thinking of a more austere way of living. That is what India was famous for earlier. Today, we've just aped the West. The West has gone at a speed at which they're destroying themselves, and we are following them. So it's, it's high time that we started realizing that there's something drastically wrong in the economy. And that's all the time we have for this edition of 101 East. You can always follow the program through our website, podcast, Facebook and Twitter. From all the team, thanks for watching.